we have a little bit of a different video today. Today I'm going to be talking about what's going on in the luxury market. Now I'm going to focus on beauty, but I am going to make some comments that are relevant to luxury, the luxury market in general. So that means fashion and the purses and all that good stuff ready to wear. Ready to wear. But I'm going to show you examples of the beauty. I was able to talk to someone great from Tom Ford. I was actually able to talk to somebody from Chanel as well just to get their thoughts about uh, what's happening in beauty. Now, I wanna make it very clear, these are all my opinions, my comments. These are not attributable to Tom Ford or Chanel or any other brand. These are opinions are all my own and uh, <laughs> not, nothing to do with any of the brands that I mentioned. So I do have a full face of old makeup on today and how old we'll get into in a moment and I will go through some of the products but really today is not about showing particular products because many of these products are long gone and, and impossible to get some of them you can still pick up from secondary markets but I really want to talk about we're seeing such a difference in luxury beauty and fashion so first I think I have five areas where I think are affecting all of this and then I'll talk about what we might see coming hopefully <laughs> maybe so I think the number one thing, and we've all talked about this and I've seen comments in my videos is clean beauty. And the, the idea of clean beauty is, is a great thing. I absolutely am in support of getting rid of hazardous, harmful chemicals and ingredients in all our products, not just beauty, but food, anything. And that has been an ongoing process for a long time. Various regulatory agencies, federal agencies, states have worked, I, I believe, very hard to try to, you know, clean up the air, clean up the water, clean up the food supply, all those things. But it's difficult, right? Because a lot of these things aren't necessarily under the purview of those agencies. And also, it's a lot of testing that goes into a lot of this. So I think, in a way, consumers took it upon themselves a couple years ago to say, we're not okay with these products in our, we're not okay with these ingredients in our products. And many, I shouldn't say many, there were a couple of brands that were started like Drunk Elephant. A woman started in Texas and I believe it's now been sold, but to take out many of the ingredients that were in products and she didn't feel that they were good to be in there. Many brands have followed suit and many brands have taken certain ingredients, chemicals, whatever, out of their products. And not too long ago, the European Union passed laws to say, you cannot have certain things in your perfumes, in your makeup, in your toiletries, like all those things, deodorants, whatever it is. The US has not passed a law specifically as it relates to makeup or perfume. There are, I do work in the, the policy space, so I'm familiar with uh, a lot of this. There are rules and laws around some things that you can't use, chemicals that have been shown to be carcinogenic are not allowed in, in certain quantities. It basically will say if it's parts per billion under or whatever, then it's okay. Otherwise, it's not. So yes, there are rules around this, but for the most part, there's things that are in our products that, um, and I say us, the United States, that are allowed to be under law, but that people don't feel, consumers don't feel that they want in their products. So recently though, the whole idea of having everything clean has really blown up. And I, I believe it's happened in large part because of COVID. And I feel like there's a before COVID and an after COVID. And we're definitely in the after COVID. And I think COVID has a lot to do with all of these things. I think if that hadn't happened, I'm not sure it would have been, I think it would have happened anyway, but I think the speed would have been different. There was a lot of concern and rightfully so after that about contaminants, about you know going out and touching things. And I think there was just a new focus on having you know a concern about what you're putting on your face what you're breathing in all those things so that in addition to the eu law a lot of brands especially global brands started to take out certain products and i think that for some brands i think it's absolutely core to their being um, drunk elephant being one westman atelier is like that there's many that are very that was their focus that's why they created the products that they created and I just called those two out, but there's many. And if you go and look around, you can and do some research, you can see the ones that really started with that goal. Then <laughs> there's marketing. Now look guys, there's nothing wrong with marketing. I market for my channel. In my thumbnails, I try to make my thumbnails look a little bit more engaging, a little bit prettier. Sometimes I use a title that will draw you in. Uh, I never lie in any, I don't do the clip, like real clickbait. I don't do that. But 
It just bothers me. But I do try to do something to try to pull people in. And that's what marketing is, right? That, that's okay up to a point. As long as what you're promising or what you're saying you're going to do, you deliver on. That's the issue here, right, with marketing. There's nothing wrong with saying your products are clean if you, there's no definition of clean in the United States. We don't have a regulatory definition anyway for makeup. So as long as you're meeting certain standards, certain things that in general, the community, beauty community has said is clean, you know, phthalates, you know, that's fine. You can do that and you can sell it that way. And it actually, it sells very well. Clean is the number one thing that people are, especially younger generation concerned about when they're looking at products. But in doing so, Many of the brands have really doubled down on this marketing is what I would say and have taken things out of products that don't necessarily need to be taken out of products or they have changed formulas that didn't need to be changed just so they could say clean. And again, since there's no true definition or regulatory structure, it's hard to tell what these different things do. So you don't really know, does this, is this harmful? Do we have studies that show it's harmful? Is it just a preference? And again, if it's a preference, that's totally fine. If I don't like, I like there's certain, I don't use retinol. I just don't use it, it's irritating to me. So anything that has retinol in it, pure retinol, like retinol, retinoid, I don't use it. That's different, that's a preference. If you, however, say there's a law in place, like the EU has that says you can't have these things, then companies can't have those things. If they're taking it out though, because they feel like the customers want it, again, that makes sense. You try to create products that, you're, that your customers will buy. It may have the effect of changing the product itself. And if they're doing it because they feel like it's better for the consumer, or if they feel like consumers, that's what they want, that's okay, because you should give the consumers what they want. But then you also have to recognize as the consumer, that you may have some of your favorite products either go away or change their formula to be what you consider not as good. I am not a scientist. I don't work in the field of creating beauty or perfumes. So I cannot tell you what the difference is specifically on one particular ingredient and you know what the studies are and what's happened and how it's been shown to be detrimental or harmful or anything else, or how it keeps a product longer, how it keeps a product safer, all those things. There's a lot involved here. I'm not here to give anyone opinion and I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just saying this is impacting the market and beauty in particular. And you just have to be aware of that as we move forward. I think you're going to continue to see it, especially with the law that passed in the EU, in, in the law that is now in the EU. And then the brands that are clean, considered clean, they have a clean stamp on them, they do sell really well. And on Sephora even, and the Sephora sales, like right around the corner when this video goes up, they have a whole clean beauty. If, if there are things that are being taken out of products, whatever they may be, and it's done for more preference than based on science that shows something's wrong with it, causes cancer, it causes whatever it does, some harmful health outcome, um, and your product, you're concerned, I would buy those products now. Again, I'm not urging anyone to go run out and buy all the Chanel quads. I'm just saying they will likely change. The companies will likely come to this. They recognize that A, it's selling well, and B, there's a law in place in the EU, which many of the products are made there. So they're, they are gonna change. Just know that, and doesn't mean those products are gonna get worse. They might get better, but just understand that that's impacting the beauty that you're buying. Good and bad. Two, there's been a focus on two particular markets in beauty and in fashion, ready to wear all that. The Asian market and the US market. It used to be way back in the day, the way, when I used to be a makeup artist for Chanel, there was, you didn't have the transparency into what other markets had. I remember once, and I was in, outside of Denver, there was a woman that came in with a product, and I honestly don't remember what it was, but it was from Europe, and we couldn't take it back. And the reason we couldn't take it back is we didn't have it in our system. Like it didn't exist. The, the product didn't exist because everything was very siloed. It was like, this is Chanel US and this is Chanel EU and this is Chanel China. Now to a certain extent, that's still true. We in the US don't get all the products that another country will get and 
it's vice versa. However, there's so much transparency online now. You see it on TikTok, you see it on... We get to see a lot of the sneak peeks that you know we get are from other markets that got it before we did and we're able to see that on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or wherever that didn't exist 25 years ago there was no way to know when I was in London and I was at Harrods I bought some things from Louis Vuitton and the Louis Vuitton boutique that's in Harrods is Louis Vuitton they have a global network so if you buy from Louis Vuitton in London it's the same as if you bought Louis Vuitton in Boston they have the same records now that's not true for every brand, but Louis Vuitton has done that. So it all goes towards your Louis Vuitton file, whatever you want to call it, portfolio. So when they look you up, it's all there, which I thought was like amazing. I didn't know that. And that was relatively recent, but I'm just saying now we're starting to all come together globally. So when the brands really doubled down on the Asian market and the US market during COVID, they started to really make product for those two markets and a lot of it a lot of it was towards the asian market because again data analytics showed that they were buying more makes sense again marketing you're, 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 who is your customer so a lot of the products that we started to see in the united states many times were more they were designed more for that customer and the customer especially in china is a little different than the market in the United States. The United States is a very diverse country. It's also enormous. It's an enormous country. Everybody's from everywhere. Very different styles all over the place. Very different tastes. It's it's not a homogeneous market. So I think there was there was some miscalculation about what the customers would want, and that has the many of the brands have recognized that and are starting to be going back in a way to more siloed. They're not more siloed. They're still very connected, but there's more of a, oh, this is, this is for South America. This is for Western Europe. This is for China. This is for Texas. <laughs> this is for wherever. Because beauty and fashion is very individual and especially makeup because it's more accessible. And we'll get to that in a minute. People might not be able to buy the ready to wear sweater, but they can buy the lipstick. So you need to give them more options and you need to provide different looks for different people. And the brands are starting to get that. So you might see more brands like Chanel or Tom Ford, or and I'm just making up names, not making up the names, but I'm making up, they might do this, Chantecaille or Rare Beauty say, okay, we're going to have, you know, a bunch of, of very light glittery things. And then we're going to have very pigmented eyeshadows and then we're going to have colorful liners and we're going to have different lines within our brand so like Dolce and Gabbana for example came out with this very nude very natural palette which I still haven't seen that has I saw it and then it disappeared a uh, leopard case and then which is was like I said very much for the person who wants like that very quiet luxury look and then they came out with I Dare You which is the exact opposite and and very close together but they're definitely two different collections. And then they have the devotion collection. So that's, I think, what you're starting to see because the Asian and the US markets economically are not doing that well. And because of that, the brands have realized, I don't think the brands realize, I don't think the brands are doing it just because they recognize that people were a little annoyed. I think they did it because those markets aren't, they're not selling as much. That's the bottom line. There's also a little bit of laziness to all this. And while I get into these later issues, these later points, I'm going to start showing you some makeup. If you're successful at something and you continue to do the exact same thing and it continues to be successful, most entities, most people don't change much, right? If you're, if you're doing something and you continue to do it and everyone tells you're doing it great and you never change, but everybody still loves it, it's, it's difficult to see the reason to change. Now, eventually everything gets old. Everything finds its time limit, right? No matter how popular or wonderful or amazing somebody is, at some point you move on to something else in fashion or in entertainment. A singer generally doesn't have a 50 year lifespan. Some do, but most don't. Most are popular for a certain amount of time and then someone else becomes popular. And the other person can still stay in the mix, but they don't have the same golden period, right? It's a shorter period. Makeup is the same way. Beauty is the same way, fashion is the same way. And so many brands 
have, you know, gotten, this has done really well, and especially the last couple years. If you look at the information, and I'll put up a couple of like clips or, or down below, reference some articles, the sales of luxury markets like beauty, fashion, ready to wear, shoes, bags, jewelry, costume jewelry, fine jewelry have skyrocketed in 2021, 2022. 2023, there, there seemed to be some turbulence, but it still went up. It was still like 4% overall. So it's not like they lost money. Now, some brands did better than other brands, but Phoebe Philo just came out with her first collection and now her second drop. And she sold out her first drop and there were things in there. I like Phoebe Philo. I'm more of that, I'm more of that aesthetic. And I was even like, yeah, that's just too much. That's, I'm not paying that for a bag. And they're cute and I like their stuff, but I was still like, and the row, for example, right? They're, they're doing extremely well. The row is like killing. It's just doing fantastic. But there's other brands that have seen some, some turbulence. So I think there is a recognition now that we're maybe not able to, the brands are like, oh man, we can't do the exact same thing over and again. And they're doing certain things to address that. So we'll get into it. What I have on my face today, like I said, is all old. And I chose Tom Ford because Tom Ford was one of my, I worked for Chanel, but outside of Chanel, Tom Ford was like the brand that I, I most, what's the word I'm looking for? Like I wanted to be a Tom Ford woman, if you will. Tom Ford went into the market, beauty market, with the thought process of we are luxury, our beauty is going to be luxury. We're going in with a price point that's high because we are luxury and that's what luxury is. And we demand it because it's quality and it's worth it. Unlike Chanel that went into the beauty market as a, a way to capture that aspirational shopper who was looking to buy a bag or a purse or something, a ready to wear or shoes or whatever, and couldn't afford it yet. Or was thinking about, I want to try Chanel. It gets you hooked in Chanel. There's the sleek black packaging. And that's why Chanel never had sales because they're luxury. They don't do sales. And it's a different mindset. Tom Ford had Charlotte Tilbury on board when he she helped him create the lines and she from everything that i hear is a very exacting person so is tom ford expects a certain level of quality in the things that she is hands-on with which is why when her brand came out when she first started her stuff was phenomenal and so different than what everybody else had nobody else had what she had on the market and so this was one of the last products that she was involved in actually at, at Tom Ford. Doesn't have the name on the back. This, cause it didn't have any labels on it. This is the Eye and Cheek Compact Pink Glow. This was summer 2015. They do these types of things still to this day, but they're more in those rectangle type of, or the squares like this, but not to the same extent. But I would also say the shades in here, the pigment in here, the way that this looks on the face, it's, the quality is phenomenally good. And I don't pink, as you all know, but I love this. So take a look at the eyes. It's impressive. That's three shades. The, this shade here in the, the middle, it doesn't look like much when you swatch it because it has, it's like a thinner formula. But when you put it on the eye, it has the same feel and look to like Metal Lust. It's that wet, see that? And the plum in here is a gorgeous satin. And this is like a beautiful light pink that I have in the brow. I mean, you can just see it's, it all just comes together beautifully. And then this I used is almost like a pinkish highlighter and this has the blush over it. I have no bronzer on today. Look at that. And I went in lightly with it because I'm so pale. And the eyeliner that I used today is something they got rid of. This is called Metallic Mink, one of my favorite shades of all time. Tom Ford liner. He had a number of liners. This shade doesn't exist in any other line I've ever seen. It is a mushroomy, purpley, grayish brown with some shimmer. Little teeny bit of metallic mink. It's metallic moss is also just. Now I did buy backups of those liners. They're sitting in a drawer with a bunch of other old makeup backups because I heard they were gonna discontinue the liners. This is way back. And I don't really know 
I don't really know what happened in the regards of being hands-on and having like a personal pride in it. But I think, and again, this is my personal opinion, my opinion alone, I think when you step away from something um, and, and you're not involved every day anymore, it loses that. It was Tom Ford and, and Charlotte Tilbury. And Charlotte Tilbury did a lot of other lines too, guys. It wasn't just Tom Ford that she was involved in. I think it becomes about the business. It becomes about the bottom line. Not because these people are bad people or they don't want to provide good service and good products, because they obviously did. They wouldn't have had the products they had in the beginning if they didn't want to. But if you've ever worked for a public company, I work for a public company right now, it's, a, it's just a very different animal. Like the goals are different than providing the best, most perfect product. It's not about the cost, right? I am sure, and again, this is me speaking, this is not attributable to anyone, but I am sure that when these directors said to the businesses, you have to go back and fix it, that's not right, and it costs 10 times more than it was supposed to, I'm sure the businesses weren't happy, but again, they were in charge. Tom Ford was in charge, Charlotte was in charge, whoever was in charge, they had final say. So it cost more. They were gonna make sure it was right. If you don't have that involved in the business and it's somebody saying, I don't care how much it costs, do it right, you get products that everyone at the end is like, yeah, I don't really like this. This is not what we talked about. But there isn't that person there to make the call to say, send it back. I don't care how much it costs, do it again. To give you an example, this for me, for this channel, I recorded this video um, about what's happening to luxury. I recorded it, it took a really long time, and I didn't like it the way that it came out. It just wasn't, it just wasn't the quality I wanted it to be. So I, this video, I'm re-recording it because I'm willing to put in the time, the energy, whatever, money, money is time, because it's me, it's my face, it's my channel, it's only me, I can do that. But if I was in charge of a business, I might not be able to do that. I might have to pay all my workers or I might have to meet quarterly whatevers. It's just a different animal. Number four, younger markets. And we all say every generation, it's every single generation, guys. I don't care like how old you are, how young you are. Every generation points to the next generation and I don't get it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. I remember my parents, the music they would listen to or things that they would do and I'd be like, what in the world? That's just how it works. And so the younger generation is different. And I say younger generation, almost like the A generation, which is the really young, like 10 and under, they're coming up and they're gonna be the next ones to, to buy these products. The generation Z that's right before that, they have a different view on this as well. And for them, at least what we've seen in trends, if you follow, now I am not, I'm on TikTok, but I don't spend a lot of time over there. It's not my favorite. And I won't get into that for personal reasons, but I just don't, it's not my thing. But I recognize it is incredibly popular and it skews young. And I do watch it though to understand what's happening because that's the biggest market. It's not the most, it's not the biggest market for luxury, but it's the biggest market. And if you look at beauty and fashion, all the things over there, it's very quick, it's very easy, it's very like. And there aren't intricate eye makeup looks. There aren't hundred shadow palettes like there was a little while ago. There isn't really a focus on luxury. There isn't a focus on taking time. There isn't a focus on, first of all, a more mature market that's looking for anti-aging things. Generally, that's not where it's going, right? And they, it seems, the focus at the moment is more like light, glittery liners, topper shade, lip glosses, skin tints. It's not a full makeup look. That's not the thing right now for the younger market. And luxury recognizes that it's an untapped market for them in general, and they're not gonna lower their prices. So what are they gonna do? They're starting to do things like minis, and you see them over at Sephora. They'll be like the mini lipstick, or the mini half foundation, or whatever it is, or the travel size perfumes. There has never been as many travel size perfumes as I've seen in the last couple years, because you can't afford the $400 bottle of perfume, but you can afford the $75, you know, 0 0.07 ounces and you can carry it around. We, luxury is starting to look at that. And how do I know that with certain, with certainty? Michaela, who is a, if you're not familiar, she's a huge influencer, especially on TikTok. She has, I'll be honest, I don't know how many she has, but she's like 17 million, some, she's huge. She also is from the Boston area. Michaela received, and I don't remember exactly when this was, last year, I think, she received a bunch of products from Westman Atelier. Westman Atelier is definitely a luxury line. Gucci Westman fronts it. Love that line. A lot of things that I really enjoy. 
and it's definitely more clean beauty, more luxury beauty. And they sent some stuff to Michaela, who tried it out on her channel. And I believe it was that day, but it could have been 48 hours. It was either sales or site visits or you know, to the West Montelier site went up 35%. Now, if you know anything about like business economics and like how, ratios and like how you transmit a video or a post into sales, 35% is like unheard of, like generally, like that's not, that's a, not a normal <laughs> conversion. Generally, you know, you get like anything over like 3% is f fantastic. 35% is phenomenal. And that's generally not her, that's not Westman's market generally. Many of the people that are on TikTok are under the age of 20, many, most frankly. There's certainly older people on there. I'm on there. There's, there's all kinds of people on TikTok. There's millions and millions of people, but people that are watching it every day tend to skew younger. So luxury is starting to figure that out. And Chanel and Dior and others are looking at TikTok to talk about their products. And they're thinking of ways to get at that younger market, whether it's uh, mini sizes of their products, getting their influence who appeals to that younger market to talk about their products, or coming up with products that are more tailored for that market. And we're seeing more of that with packaging and maybe like products like the colorful eyeliners or whatever it may be that you might look at and be like, that's not what I want. But again, there's a whole nother market out there. And again, this video isn't to say this is good or bad. It's just to give you insights into why these things are changing so that you can make decisions about what you want to buy when you buy it. Because if that's the trend, if that's how things are going, then when something pops up that you really love, you may decide, oh, I'm going to get two of these, or I'm going to at least buy this one thing because I'm not going to wait for next year's collection because I really love this thing and waiting for next year's collection might not be the right thing for me. Like you have to make that determination, but you can't make the determination without knowing all the facts. Um, last I would say is the accessibility issue. So we've seen recently, Hermes brought a class, two people in California brought a class action lawsuit against Hermes. Chanel won a lawsuit against what goes around in New York, which is a reseller about, and it really all comes down to accessibility. Like how, difficult is it to get something? How elite is something? How inaccessible is something? And just the human condition, and again, I'm only gonna speak for myself here, when something is impossible to get, when, when someone tells you you can't have that, as a general rule, you want it more, or at least I do. Again, speaking for myself, not speaking for any of you out there. But if someone says to me, you absolutely can never have an Hermes Birkin bag because you must spend $30,000 in the Hermes store before we even talk to you, yeah, it's, it's very unlikely <laughs> that I'm gonna get a Birkin bag because I don't need plates and a wall hanging, <laughs> whatever. Plus I hate being told, I, I, I am one of those people that the minute you tell me I have to do something, I really don't wanna do it. Like now I'm annoyed, um, especially if there's no good reason for it. If you tell me I have to do something because in the future it's gonna be better for the house or if, if I have to build a really good foundation and yes, it's tedious and boring, it will, the house will last a hundred years longer. Then I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Okay, I'll do that. But if you tell me I have to do something just because, that generally doesn't go over well with me because I'm like, there's no reason for that. I'm not doing it. That's how I feel about the Hermes thing. I'm like, why should I have to spend $30,000 on things I don't want? If it was me going in, and I do, I buy Hermes. I have shoes, I have scarves. I now have a bag, thanks to my husband, but I like Hermes, I buy things from Hermes, but I never buy things with the intention of, oh, if I do this, I'm gonna get this thing later. That's just not how I am or how I shop or how I do things. So if I'm nice to someone, I'm nice to someone because I'm nice to them. Because it's better to be a good person, in my opinion, like life is short, be a good, be a decent person. It doesn't, this is really not that hard. You don't expect anything back from it. So why would you have this situation that you have to go into this one store and like basically do all of these hoops to get a bag? Now the exclusivity of it though, yes, I do want it more, but I gotta tell you, if the Birkin bag or the Kelly bag was not well made, I would not want it. I really wouldn't. I believe in quality for things. There are many times I've talked about brands, Chanel, Dior, Tom Ford, where I've been like, this is a, not a good product. I don't care who put their name on it. It's not a good product, so I'm not gonna say it is. That is the accessibility, the elusiveness 
charm for a lot of people. And if something from Chanel has a $110 price tag, obviously it's harder to get because you have to spend a lot more money to get it. And money is hard to earn, hard to get. It's more elusive. It's more, it's more inaccessible. It's more special. A lot of people will be like, I have to have that because not that many people can have it. I totally get that mindset. I can be that way too. Absolutely. So brands know that. And there is a sense that they're just going to keep racketing up the prices until they hit a point where people stop buying, where it stops working. And it will be very interesting to see if maybe some brands have hit it. Chanel just had their recent increase on bags. I gotta tell you guys, like I mentioned in another video, I was looking at ready to wear, and there is a couple of things that came out for summer that I just loved. There's this, I'll put up a picture of it. It's like this lace, very colorful floral. There's a blouse. There's like a, a long jacket. There's, and I love this look. Now I wouldn't put it all together. I'm too short. It would just look weird. But I was thinking like the duster maybe, or the, it's, it is ridiculous. I understand there's a tremendous amount of skill that went into making this, but in my opinion, Chanel, Chanel has lost sight of, of reality. Now here's the thing though. If it sells out, if all the shoes sell out, if all the makeup sells out, then they're not wrong. So all of it is on us as consumers to make those types of decisions and say, that's a step too far, that's too much, right? And so we'll see, we'll see what happens with this recent increase. Now again, that's bags, um, but you know, like a, a classic flap, which I do not own, a uh, classic flap, I'll put up a picture if you're not familiar with it, there's different sizes, there's small, medium, um, jumbo, large jumbo and maxi. I actually like the jumbo size. I like the bigger bags. I'm just one of those people. I am not a tiny bag energy woman. I am a very large energy. I like large bags. And the funny thing is I'm very small. I'm five feet tall. So like, it's interesting that I like a really big bag and I know a lot of like very tall people who like very tiny bags. I don't know. Anyway, that's not the point. I don't own one. I, I have thought over the years that I'd get one, but I don't like chain straps. That's the thing that bugs me. So to spend $10,000 on a bag that I won't wear very often is not gonna happen. I, they do have ones with leather straps on the top and then the chain. Those aren't the classic flaps, but they're different styles. So I might buy one of those. And honestly, they're much cheaper because they're not the classic flap. But even then the prices have gotten out of control. I will be buying a Chanel bag this year. There's a couple of styles that I want. I'm gonna actually have my luxury wish list video go up probably in May, because that's my birthday. And that's when I buy something special for myself, if I can. Um, but it's gonna be on the pre-loved market because the styles I like and the things that I want and the quality that I want, yeah, they used to exist. I don't think they exist anymore. And the accessibility thing reaches a, it reaches a limit. This year, in the last couple of weeks, I have seen so many resellers with ads marketing on social media about, hey, Chanel is increasing their prices 11% or whatever. You can buy the same bag here with better quality at less money. And when they mean by better quality is back in the day, the CCs, it was before, is it 2000 and five, I can't remember the exact date when they switched over, but they used to have 24 karat gold plating on the CCs on the front of the bag. In fact, the jewelry used to be 24 karat plating. They got rid of that. And in fact, if you look at what I'm wearing today, these are Christian Dior earrings, which I love. I got these in Greece. I love these earrings. Christian Dior actually has a new version of this CD thing. If you look at it really close, you see the C and the D is hanging from it. There's a new version of these earrings with the C and the D design, which I really like and I might buy. But these are not plated gold. These are, I forget what it's called, but they're something with the overlay, but they're not real gold in any way. This piece is a Trafari piece from 1950, and this is gold plated. And this necklace was, I believe, cheaper than these earrings <laughs> when I bought it. Now, it may be more now because these are these are pieces that, that collectors are, are looking to buy. But if you can see this necklace, and I'll do a close up, do you see the intricacy in this necklace that Trafari did? It's a stunning piece. Now these earrings are beautiful and I really like them, but the intricacy and the detail and the workmanship didn't go as much into to these as this. And these were more expensive. There's, there's disconnects, right? And again, it has to do with this accessibility thing where consumers, including myself, are buying a pair of costume jewelry earrings. Like Chanel has earrings that I like that are $1,500. 
it used to be for a price point like that compared to where we were making, that would be fine jewelry or at least semi-fine jewelry, not costume jewelry. But it's because the Chanel name is on it or the Dior name is on it or whatever. So as consumers, we have, we do have power in this relationship. We can say, that's too much, I'm not gonna buy that. Or I'm gonna go to the pre-love market and buy it there. So what does this really all mean like for next steps and, and like how does it affect your buying decisions? Like I said, when you start to see things that you really like, I wouldn't wait too long on them. If it's something like, if it's a really well-made product by a brand that you want to buy, like Chanel, when they came out with their winter five pan, I can't remember the name of it right now. I loved the quality in that. It was like the quality of old. I'm not saying that the shades were particularly unique because they really weren't, but the quality was excellent. I bought that immediately. And when I realized the quality of it, I was like, oh, this is something that is like worth my money. And I was impressed. And Nui, the one that came out with Nui was also good. The Rivage, love the Rivage, love the Blue Abyss liner. I think it's like a standout for Chanel. I wouldn't wait on those products. I would buy them. If you're a Chanel lover and that's, you, you buy Chanel. Like, I'm not telling you go buy things that you don't want to get. I'm saying, don't say to yourself, oh, I'm sure there'll be this next year. I wouldn't bank on that. One of the things I'd say is that the Chanel, particularly this summer collection from, spring collection from Chanel, those are from these three women that got together collectively to put that collection together. I'm not exactly sure, and neither is Chanel as far as I know, what's happening with them long-term. The spring, the summer collection that we're gonna see, the I can't remember the name of it, I'll put it here. I can't put the picture, but I can put, there's the trio bronzer blush highlighter thing. There's lipsticks, there's, there's, there, there are new things coming. There are also, from what I can tell, and I'm not absolutely sure I'm trying to check on this, tweed blushes in Asia. They look like different names to me. But again, I can't put the picture up because Chanel will take my channel down. So I, I think Chanel, Tom Ford, and Dior and other brands are starting to recognize oh, we might have a problem. It's hard to tell, but I think they are. And I think they're also noting that other brands are getting in this space. Prada, Hermes, and now Celine. Now if Celine comes, they have like, they have one lipstick that's coming out and then they'll have, you know, following lipsticks. If they do their products as well as they've done their bags and their clothes, they will have a hit on their hands. Because I gotta tell you, and even their perfumes. Celine quality from what I've seen in their bags is really good, really impressive. I'm like, it's, it, it always has been, but it was under Phoebe Philo before. And so now, you know, it's a little different, but their quality is really good. The bags are well made. They have a great design idea. The Triumph bags are fantastic. The Celine 16 is fantastic. Uh, fantastic. I want one, but again, I'm trying not to just buy everything. I have a Kelly bag now, so I'm like, you don't need a bag. But yeah, the Celine 16, one of my favorites. Either shoes are fantastic, their perfumes are amazing. My favorite is black tie. If you're a vanilla lover, try Celine black tie. Promise you, you will not be disappointed. They have travel spray <laughs> for, for your market. Or if you don't wanna spend as much money on a full bottle or you don't use as much perfume. Scarves, clothes, really. They have some great sunglasses. They don't look good on me, but they're great sunglasses. If they can do their makeup line like they've done, they're ready to wear in bags and stuff, I will buy it. And that's what I'm, saying the other brands, the, the Dior's, the Chanel's, Tom Ford's who've been around, they've had the market. I think they're starting to realize, okay, they've had some turbulence, like the luxury market's had some turbulence in 2023. They might have some in 2024. And now you have Prada coming in and making fantastic eyeshadows and amazing matte lipsticks. Possibly my favorite, by the way. I'll have that in my best and worst of <laughs> videos. But now you've got Armes that came up with amazing eyeshadows and they have great lipsticks and like these are huge competitors and now you have Celine doing it? Yeah, there's definitely a, oh, we might have to do something a little unique. We might have to do something a little bit different. And Tom Ford, I will say, has been, yes, they're going through turbulence. Tom Ford is leaving. He's not technically gone yet, guys, but he is, he's on his way out. Yeah, it's gonna be different. We'll see what happens. But I can tell you there's many people at Tom Ford that absolutely are committed to, to having, you know, great products, but they have to take in all those things. The clean beauty stuff, the fact that they're dealing with the younger market that they're trying to sell to, the fact that if they keep prices lower, people don't want them as much because they figured that there's a part of the consumer base that's all oh, not as expensive and it's not as good, which is not true, but 
It's a mindset. The fact that the US and the Asian markets are not doing as well now. So they're trying to deal with that. And then just being, like I said, and I call it lazy, but basically this, we've done the same thing and it's worked. So why should we change? The, there's That is combating with the, no, we have to change. Things aren't working and all these people are coming in. So some stores, and Dior has already done this, are making their stores like more of destinations. Uh, Dior closed their store in Paris for two years and reopened it with, I think it's got an apartment in it that you can rent. I'm sure that's not cheap, but the point is there's like galleries, there's museums, you can go, there's like different levels. The Prada store in Vegas, by the way, guys, Prada is not a brand that I really have been that into the last couple years, but I spent more time in that Prada store in Vegas because that store is worth spending some time in. It's beautifully laid out. They bring you some water or whatever else you want. Like there's a little bathroom in there. Like you can just relax. You can try on anything you want. There's no pressure. I, there's a pair of, there's a pair of sneakers that I want from Prada and I'm not going to buy them online. I'm going to buy them from the store in Las Vegas, even though there's a Prada store in Boston, because I had an amazing experience there that used to be the norm in luxury and everyone got away from it for a long time. And some of that was COVID. I get that. But I think stores are, and brands are starting to realize they need to do more of that. And you're starting to see pop-ups, the Valentino truck outside of Harrods, the uh, Max Mara teddy bear. <laughs> I didn't get to see it. Hut or whatever it was. Yeah, that was also in London, but there's ones in New York. That kind of stuff gets people interested. And, and I don't know about all of you, but for me, if you go into a store and you're like talking to people and there's a great sales associate who knows all her stuff and says, hey, this is coming out then, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for you. And when you look for sunglasses and you can't find any that you like, brings over the pair of black and white sunglasses that are something you would have never looked at but are perfect for you, right there, you're like, I'm gonna buy from these people. This is great customer service. Why wouldn't I buy? It's worth it. See, so that used to be, the, that used to be what luxury was, but again, there was, a movement away from that, especially like everyone buying online. But now I think there is a lot of interest in going back to the store, not only from customers, but from the brands themselves. And the other thing I'd say is this personal touch. One of the reasons that brands started to, to provide product to people like myself, but people much bigger than me, obviously, on YouTube and Instagram and as now especially TikTok, is because brands started to realize that the old way of advertising, and it's still true, but like having Cindy Crawford, for example, advertise your makeup on television wasn't getting at the, the market or the demographic that they wanted. And one of the reasons is, especially the younger customer base, doesn't trust, isn't as trusting, which makes sense. You can never tell what's really real online. So they develop relationships with influencers, people on Instagram or, a TikTok or here on YouTube where they feel like get to know a person. And I, I think there's something to that. And they feel like, oh, I know that person's not going to lead me in a bad way. They've always recommended good things. I feel like there's a personal relationship like they had in the store and they can trust that. And that personal touch has a lot to do with why brands started providing product and doing sponsorships and stuff like that. Some brands have taken it a step farther, like Westman and Victoria Beckham obviously does this as well where the person who created the brand is really the face of the brand. And they go out and do the TikToks. They do the Instagrams. They do the YouTubes. Lisa Eldridge, right? They go up and be like, this is how you use my makeup. This is what it's good for. This is what... That is invaluable because Westman Italia, headed by, by Gucci Westman, she's a makeup artist. She did for various years, a long time. She knows her stuff. She knows how things work and she knows her products because she created them. So you can trust her. You might not like a product that she creates, but you know that she knows what it is and how it works. And so that personal touch that she gets on and puts the makeup on herself, I think we're going to see more and more of that. To give you an idea about like personal touch and, and how things develop, this liner that I have on today, this is a Tom Ford liner, but he did not call them liners. Why? Because Tom Ford did not believe in lip liners. Tom Ford said if a lipstick is made right, and he had amazing lipsticks in the beginning, guys. I bought all his lipsticks, which eventually went bad, but that's because the ingredients were so good and so fresh that they went bad immediately. See, just because it's clean and good doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you. He didn't believe in lip liners for that reason. But he did eventually agree to lip sculptors, which is like what Lisa Elders just came out with. And this is Extort, which is my favorite. They don't exist anymore, 
they had this really interesting shape. It's like a triangle product, actually. And Extort is a deep brown. It's just a great shade. It's not a deep brown, but it's like a pinky brown. It's just a great shade. This stuff does not come off. It stays on your lips. It does not come off. Also, it keeps in your gloss. If you put the gloss on over it, and I do have, this is the Tom Ford gloss. This is an old gloss. I do not recommend you putting this on your lips because this is really old if you have it. This is Pink Gilt. Again, this doesn't exist anymore in this formula. And you can even see the brush, which I did not use. I used a different brush. It's like a very thin brush. But this Pink Gilt, oh, I loved this shade. I have it on today, but I feel okay putting it on my lips because I was like, it's my lips. If I, then the risk is fine. I wouldn't have put it on somebody else, but it's just such a beautiful shade. And it just, it looks so good. It doesn't look gloppy. It doesn't look too much. And it's just, oh, it's just stunning. <laughs> I miss the old Tom Ford. But I would tell you this, there's a possibility a little birdie might have mentioned, again, only attributed to me saying this, could be totally wrong, that we might see liners from Tom Ford. So things, just because they're changing doesn't mean they're always bad. Sometimes it can mean a good thing. So that's why what's happening with luxury. There's so much more to all of this, but this in and itself is, is a long video. And I just wanted to give you the facts behind all of this so you can take into account what you wanna do when products come out. When you see these luxury brands, like Celine, for example, that's entering the market, I will definitely try out the lipstick and I'll tell you all what I think. It's going to be expensive, there's no doubt. When Prada came out and Hermes came out, Prada is not nearly as expensive as Hermes, but they're not inexpensive. These are not cheap brands. Westman Atelier, actually, it hasn't been around that long, guys. If you compare it to Chanel, it's, it's seconds. And they're doing really great things. They're making great products. So there are new brands out there. Swede Beauty hasn't been around that long. And I have to tell you, Swede Mascara is one of my favorite new mascaras. It's phenomenally good. The person who created it is a makeup artist and it hits all, it's not gonna be for everyone because no product is for everyone, but it's a really good product. And it hits a lot of the check marks that I would want in a mascara. That doesn't negate the fact that I still love the original Chanel mascara from forever long ago. It just means you're gonna see new products that you know, you might want to be like, oh, I'll, I'll take a look at that. And I'm just going to give you one example before I go. And I'll talk about this in the Sephora video. Um, I always bought the soft moisturizing lotion from La Mer, which is in a pump. That was my daytime moisturizer. It, I always get it at the Sephora sale because it's 20% off. And La Mer generally doesn't go on sale. Sometimes you can get it at Neiman's or, Mar or Bergdorf's for 20, 25, maybe. But 20 is, that's pretty good. So I always buy it there. I'm not buying it this Sephora sale because I'm using the One Skin facial moisturizer. I don't feel like I need it. And the One Skin is a lot cheaper than the La Mer. I've been using that for years, years, guys. So just to say, you know, you have to, this doesn't put everything all in the same bucket. You have to be deliberate in what you buy. All of these things, these luxury things are going to be expensive. They're going to continue to be that way. You know, plan your purchases carefully. Take into account the things that matter to you and understand all these different factors that are impacting the luxury market as a whole so you can help make better informed decisions. And as always, you can ask me, uh, I'll give you my opinion that you might not agree with it, but that's totally fine, but I'm happy to give you any details that I have or any information that I have that can help you make those decisions. So thanks so much for joining me today, guys. I really do appreciate it. And I hope to see you in another video really soon. Thank you.